I V M. Hi everybody, just wanted to ask everyone for a quick favor. We're running a brand survey right now and would really appreciate it if you could let us know what you think about the advertising on IVM. Go to ivmpodcast.com slash survey and do let us know. As part of this, we'll be selecting 10 random participants and sending them some IVM swag. So do fill out those surveys. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hi, I'm Sarthak, and I welcome you to one more episode of All Things Policy. In this episode, we are going to talk about democracy. There's a context to today's discussion, In recent times, there have been apprehensions about democratic systems. Different studies reflect this trend. The Freedom House reports point towards a continuous retreat of democracy world over for the last 14 years. Surveys conducted by Pew Research also point to the same trend. In this episode, we'll look at some factors which can increase trust in democracy and democratic institutions. To discuss this, I have with me my colleague Apoor. Apoor manages Takshila's flagship PGP program in public policy. Hi, Apoor. Welcome to All Things Policy. Hey, thanks, Arthur. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. So before we dive into the factors which impact democracy, I think we should discuss the impacts of democracy on any society. So are there any studies, empirical evidences, which point towards some of the impacts of democracy on any society? All right, Arthur. So there are, I would say that I would categorize uh, the this kind of literature into two broad categories. One category is about democracy and its positive impacts on overall economic growth or GDP growth, income, prosperity, and so on and so forth. But then there is a, a recent set of literature and this set of literature has emerged in the past six to seven years, I would believe. Uh, right? Uh, it talks about the twilight of democracy or the backsliding of democracy, a term that has been of use in these literature. So this, the latter literature talks about the backsliding of democracy the past seven or eight years, uh, which is what you were talking about in your introductory note. While the former uh, set of literature, mostly academic literature, uh, and one of, and most of them are actually classic pieces of, of you know, economic development, economics and, and political science. They talk about political implications of democracy how democratic institutions impact economic growth, prosperity, uh, and also shaping or reshaping a society. Uh, so let me sort of, uh, you know, give you some examples of, of this kind of literature. And, you know, let me begin by talking about the classic literature, a classic book of Darren Aswog, Dwayne Robinson, A White Asian State. And the central argument is uh, that the democratic institutions lead to inclusive institutions that can further lead to economic growth, prosperity, uh, and and development. And they compare inclusive institutions with extractive institutions, which are a sort of, you know, which hamper progress. But then the recently, uh, as Moglu and Robinson have written a uh, narrow corridor about which we have, you know, we, we, we recorded an episode a few months ago. So Taren, uh, so Nav Corridor also talks about, you know, few conditions uh, that can lead to good and robust democracy, which can also lead to capability and prosperity. And, you know, the recent paper by S. Mokno with others, I mean, which is the theme of our podcast, uh, the title of this uh, paper is Successful Democracies Breed Their Own Support. I mean, the main argument of this paper is that uh, the amount of time that a society or a country spends within a, as a democratic sort of a country or within democratic uh, principles, it is correlated to the support of the democracies, which is also known as, you know, democratic cap. And, and there are other studies also, Santak. So, for example, last year, Lancet published a study, you know, at the peak of, of pandemic, which spoke uh, about, you know, the central argument uh, by the authors were was that democratic countries are able to focus more on universal health coverage. There is an increase in public health spending, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so this is the kind of literature that has, you know, uh, emerged in the past few years. And, uh, you know, and this is what our theme of this podcast is. 
Yeah, so this is something that I think I should have uh, pointed out in the beginning. So when we are talking about democracy, we are talking about liberal democracies. We are not talking about uh, democracy just like a procedural democracy. We are not talking about brute majority. We are talking about those kind of democratic setups which have rule of law. So basically, we are talking about republics. That's right, Sartak. So uh, good clarification because we are we are not talking about procedural democracy. We are talking about substantive democracy. And the Lancet study, which I quote, is of uh, you know is is about substantive democracy because they argue that uh, within a democratic uh, setup, uh, the citizens would hold the public representatives accountable for delivering uh, public health services, right? And this is very much different uh, from casting your votes after every five years. Yeah, exactly. So in the, in the recent paper by Asmoglu. successful democracies breed their own support so they have identified certain factors which can lead to increase in support for democracy and democratic institutions and the study revolves around two things one is exposure to democracy second is experience of successful democracy now what they are saying is I mean, the first hypothesis that they are trying to uh, study is if there are people who are exposed to democracies then their support for democracy increases so if people are not exposed to democracy uh, again they might be supporting authoritarian rule they are they might be supporting our ar- uh, army rule now this is interesting because this come to think of it there are different setups right now there are certain political regimes which are democratic there are certain political regimes which are authoritarian so if you are in an authoritarian regime then your support or the tra- the, the transition from authoritarian regime to a uh, democratic regime might be more difficult so how do they understand these things how do they conduct these studies so what they have done is they have tried to study the experience of immigrants right there have there might be some people who would have been born and brought up in authoritarian regimes and over a period of time they might have moved towards democratic setups and then how is uh, their experience changing so that way they have tried to understand it and again they have looked at different numbers and they are saying that if you are if you are exposed to 20 years of democracy then your preference for a democratic regime increases by almost 8% that's almost this gap is almost equal to the gap that people have preference for democracy in hong kong and people have preference for uh, democracy in mainland china that's right sathak and uh, you know this study uh, this paper is is actually very interesting because all the uh, you know older studies on uh, you know that revolves around democracy and economic growth and and you know if i if i may recall i think lipsid the classic uh, paper by lipsid actually talks about this modernization theory right that you know democracy will sort of survive or sustain at higher uh, income levels and uh, you know and, and by the way india is an outlier on that front uh, as as i by uh, arvind the subramaniam in his paper on precocious democracy uh, this paper is uh, this paper by ls mogul is is very interesting because they argue that it's not only the income levels but the exposure of democracy as highlighted by you is what matters for the support of democracy and you know there are few uh, advantages that they have quoted they have argued that it is these three or four broad advantages that give incentives to citizens to provide their support to democratic institution and these four factors are higher economic growth you know peace political stability and you know an efficient sort of public public service delivery mechanism yeah so so what they are saying is economic growth if it is there so in that case people's support for democracy will increase people's trust in democratic institutions will increase right so it's not just exposure experience in a democracy is also equally important right. so if you are in a democratic setup and there is economic growth which is being ensured by the democratic setup then people's trust might increase but it's not the only factor apart from economic growth there are some other factors as well for example peace and political stability so you might be in a democratic setup but if you don't have enough peace you do not have enough political stability then again trust in democracy might go down and it can lead to a situation where people might along for having authoritarian leaders people might uh, want to have uh, leaders who do not really care about parliament or who do not really care really care about how election processes are being conducted or uh, they might also 
want to have or they might want to be governed under experts who might not have any form of legitimacy or right? who who might not have been elected by some legitimate processes so and they, they look at different countries and they find out that there are some countries where which has had long history of political instability and here again the trust in democratic institutions is quite low they give the give, give the example of philippines and the third point that you pointed out that uh, high public expenditure is also important now what they are saying is in a democracy if the quality and quantity of services public services are good people's trust in the setup increases but again how do you measure quantify the quality and the quantity of public services for that what they are doing is they are using a proxy of public expenditure so if the public expenditure is quite high then people might trust these institutions that people might trust the political institutions more right satak and uh, you know uh, a broad sort of a take away from this particular argument is somewhat similar to what the authors of twilight of democracy on the past 7 or 8 years of people who have started writing about the backsliding of democratic principles uh, i think their argument is also somewhat similar because this is what they argue that post 2008 financial crisis the global economy has not sort of sort of bounced back to its pre financial crisis sort of you know in our conditions and that is why there is a massive backlash because there are lack of opportunities then there is an elite capture then there is also a cultural backlash and you know these three or four sort of you know these three four ingredients make it a, a very good sort of a cocktail for a populist or a majoritarian food uh, that has prevailed uh, across the world and which is what you know of freedom survey of bdm report also also talk about so i think their argument is also very much similar to the argument ironically i would say because this is about the success of democracy but uh, ironically their argument is very much similar to what other authors uh, have been you know like larry tamant and others have been arguing for the past few years yeah but i think the kind of sample set and the kind of quantitative research that is there in the paper would have been slightly different i guess i mean that this level of details might not have been there in the previous studies maybe maybe yeah uh, so another interesting aspect here is i mean they have talked about the the factors which can uh, uh, improve uh, trust in uh, a democracy right how experience of a successful democracy leads to greater support for democracy and all the three factors are economic growth political and uh, political stability and peace and high public expenditure now again i find that there is some form of uh, overlap between these factors right there is some form of linkage right uh, now for example if you are uh, if you have economic growth then only maybe you can ha- go for high public expenditure if you have economic growth then only maybe you can ensure peace and political stability without economic growth providing for these things might be difficult just think of it right if the economic growth is not there then you might not be able to create institutions or you might your institutions might not be staffed properly to ensure peace and political stability if you are having economic growth then again the conflicts can be taken care of similarly if you have high economic growth then only you have a scope for providing different kind of uh, public services the quality of services can also improve and in fact uh, sometimes it might you might feel uh, people might feel that high we are talking about high public expenditure when you talk about high public expenditure people might have these apprehensions that uh, Uh, we are being socialist the government is doing everything but contrary to this what evidences we have is if the per capita incomes are high if the gdp is high uh, the proportion of public expenditure is quite high countries like us sweden there the public expenditure proportion of its gdp is quite high in us the public expenditure is almost 38% of its gdp in sweden it is almost 49% of its gdp while in india it is quite low it's around 27% so countries which have high gdp high gdp per capita they also tend to have high public expenditure so again you need to have high economic growth to ensure high public expenditure so there is some form of an overlap here in the that side south and as you were talking about this see my good stop but but to recall uh, some of the reviews and the comments that came by that came by uh, from from some of the scholars and reviewers uh, when the nation speed was uh, launched a few years ago Uh, and they said that you know this is a chicken and egg situation that good institutions it could economic growth or could economic growth lead to good institutions so actually there is a massive overlap between this theme and you know and the, there are massive overlaps in the themes that you know as we and others have discussed in the recent paper as you have said
yeah this is interesting now another uh, dimension that uh, we uh, need to look at is what are the implications for india right all these uh, points that we have all these factors uh, can lead to strengthening of democracy and how does india perform along these lines and what could be its implications on the democratic setup of india so if you look at all these uh, factors right economic growth for example now economic there was an the economy actually contracted last year during the time of the pandemic and even now even even though the economy has uh, grown but it is not yet at the pre pandemic levels and even before the pandemic right so the economy had been the economic growth rates had been decreasing so again if the economic growth rates are not increasing if if the economy is not growing at a good pace then there are chances that people might start questioning the present setup people might start questioning the democratic institutions there might be preference for authoritarian regimes so this is something that we need to be worried about second thing is when it comes to peace and political stability right again there have been different kind of challenges in the indian context there have been different kinds of conflicts not necessarily armed conflicts but different kinds of other conflicts right communal conflicts other kind of issues have been there so if peace and political stability gets hampered right again questions will be raised about the democratic setup and we have seen different kinds of conflicts emerging and the third thing is uh, public expenditure now in the last couple of years our public finance situation has not been really good and since the economy is not doing well it does not provide sufficient bandwidth for the governments to be spending on public expenditure public services right so this again can lead to a situation where uh, again democratic democracy might backslide so if you analyze along these three lines there can be challenges to the democratic institutions people might question the legitimacy of these institutions right sir thank and uh, if you see a lot of the sort of a turmoil and the clash if i may use the word that has gripped the world in the past 7 or 8 years is similar to what you have just said that most of the the, the four factors that was going to note that it is these four factors that lead to a robust democracy and a robust democracy ensure that these four uh, sort of factors are there in a society so that the society can progress and thrive and if for you know if these two camps are sort of you know compromised then we are in a big situation and you know in india we were seeing a lot of this unraveling so as you said that you know it novix is is in disarray i would go ahead and say that even our social fabric is 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 in disarray uh, in the past several or eight years uh, and uh, because of that many indian scholars have started talking and of course they have written a lot in the past seven eight years about the backsliding of indian democracy uh, and the end of of it democracy so 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 what i guess uh, you know this is what uh, uh, is written what situation for all of us because as i said that you know a lot uh, this lot of entropy in our society and our economics in india and and you know globally and a lot will depend on how these factors which sort of play how these factors will interact with each other so that a robust democracy is ensured both in the world and in india but that's the beauty and watch situations are and i'm very optimistic yeah. about it correctly pointed out apoor so uh, thanks apoor for joining us in this episode thanks to our listeners for tuning in we'll meet again in one more episode of all things policy if you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ivm network you can tune into them on the ivm podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts you can also follow ivm on social media The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in. Hey, it's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On Last Brand Standing is the Battle of the Biscuits, Britannia versus ITC, as Anupam and Ambi discuss ITC's aggressive play to break into Britannia's strong market hold. On Cyrus Says, Mountaineer Aditya Gupta talks about his book, Seven Lessons from Everest. 
Why is the Mopla Rebellion of 1921 causing such a stir in Kerala? An eye-opening conversation on the wire talks between Siddharth and Manu Pillai. On All Things Policy, Mir talks to researchers Anirudh Tagat and Saksham Singh about the dark sides to the ease of use of smartphone financial apps. And on Advertising is Dead, Varun speaks to Samir Nayo, CEO of Applause Entertainment. They talk about where the future of media lies. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. And finally, we would like to thank our sponsors this week on the network, Seat Cred, Bank of Baroda, Quarter, CoinSwitch, Kuber, and Intuit India. Thank you so much for making this possible. Whether you're an established sports person or a budding one, or simply a sports enthusiast, join us, Tanvi and Shlok. We are two passionate pro badminton players talking policy, mindset, and everything sport. So tune in to the Millennial Athlete every Monday. Only on the IVM Podcast Network. Trust us, it's going to be lit.